And so the title of the message today is No Cross, No Crown. Let me turn this down a little bit. You know, I'm, in, I'm a street preacher, so I always want to be heard, but sometimes I can blow people's ears. <laughs> so um, let me know if, I, if it's too loud still. <laughs> Uh, so we're going to go to our opening text of Revelation 22, looking at verse 12. Should be familiar to uh, us seasoned Adventists. Revelation 22, looking at verse 12. And the Bible tells us, it says, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his works shall be. That verse is written in red because who says it? Jesus Christ, who tells us that he's coming again and that when he comes, the cases have already been decided and he's coming with a reward. What is that reward? What is the reward? You know, we haven't really talked about that much uh, lately. Um, the reward. So let's look at 1 Peter chapter uh, 5, looking at verse 4, and it talks of this reward. 1 Peter Chapter 5, looking at verse 4, and the Bible tells us in uh, verse 4, it says, And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive what? A crown of glory that faded not away. So the reward is what? It's a crown, and it's talking about, first of all, the chief, the chief shepherd, which is who? Is it the pastor? Is it the pope? No. Is it the head elder? No. It's Jesus. And when he comes, it says he's bringing, what, a crown of glory, also known as the crown of life, uh, that will never fade, it will never dim, it will never get dusty. Amen? Amen. And this will be our reward. Now, the book Early Writings, page 288, says, I saw a very great number of angels bring from the city gl uh, glorious crowns, a crown for every saint with his name written thereon. As Jesus called for the crowns, angels presented them to him, and with his own right hand, the lovely Jesus placed the crowns on the head of the saints. So here it tells us we're going to have what? A personalized crown. Personalized. So that means uh, when when I get this crown, it's going to say, Tate Kimmer right on my crown. Uh -oh. Amen? Chris Hare. Uh, Kathleen Hare. <laughs> uh, Brother David, what's your last name again? Paul. 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 David Hall. Going to have a personalized crown with your name on it. Gerald Coleman. Might even have our middle name. Gerald Blair Coleman. <laughs> <laughs> now, who is it that gets these crowns? Who is it that gets these crowns? Well, it's those that believe in the death of Jesus Christ and have committed their lives to Jesus. But how are they described? In James chapter 1, looking at verse 12, look what the Bible tells us. In James chapter 1, looking at verse 12, it says, Blessed is the man that what? Endure temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to those that love him. So here it tells us that those who receive the crown of life, they don't only love Jesus, but it says they love Jesus enough to endure temptation. That word endure comes from the Greek word hupomino, which means to persevere and to be patient. Now notice it doesn't say that they give up because uh, it's hard living right in these last evil days. Notice it doesn't say they give into temptation because it seems like everybody else is doing it. They don't give into temptation. It says they endure temptation and they don't even give it give into it occasionally, the Bible tells us that they endure it. So if we find ourselves giving into temptation even occasionally, something is going to have to uh, change in our spiritual life in the near and immediate future uh, because those who receive the crown are what? Enduring temptation. So if I find myself giving in to temptation, that means something's got to change before Christ comes because guess what? Those that get the crown are not giving in. And that's something, that's something that has to change is I'm going to have to start spending, you're going to have to start spending more time in the Word of God. 
We're going to have to spend more time pleading with our Father in prayer, and we're going to have to start being willing to die to self. And that means less time uh, on social media, less time uh, uh, with entertainment, which can be our greatest hindrance to spiritual growth. Now, I used to say that the television was our greatest hindrance because Ellen White tells us that uh, the theater is Satan's most effective way to demoralize God's people. But now the theater is no longer as transitioned from the AMC building at the mall into our own personal living rooms. But it has now transitioned, not, not only was it brought into our living rooms, but now it has transitioned into the palms of our hands. And now that it's so convenient, many of us, we're watching it all day long. Many uh, professed Christians uh, were watching something on YouTube, watching something on Netflix while we drive, while we wash dishes, while we take a shower, even in our bed with our earbuds on. So it, 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 what, what we need to do is we need to shut these devices off and we need to start uh, uh, spending more time with the Lord, quiet time with the Lord. Do we still have that quiet time with the Lord? Now notice how Ellen White describes the reward of the saints. In the book Early Writings, page 16, she says, On the sea of glass, the 144,000 stood in a perfect square. Some of them had very bright crowns, others not so bright. Some crowns appeared heavy with stars, while others had but a few. All were perfectly satisfied with their crowns. So Ellen White uh, reflects in this, in this vision that that uh, she saw that the saints will have a crown, but what's on the crown? Some will be brighter and some will be less bright due to what? The star. So what determines the, uh, 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 the, the, the number of stars that we have on our crowns? Let's go to Daniel chapter 12. Daniel chapter 12, looking at verse 3. Daniel 12, verse 3. And look what the Bible says. It says, And they that uh, be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that what? Turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. So that tells us that the brightness of our crowns is determined by the number of souls that we lead to who? To Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know about you, but I personally want a heavy crown with a whole lot of stars on it. Amen. A whole lot of stars, a very bright crown. Now, we need to understand that though we are saved by grace, we are saved by grace through faith, not of works. We're saved by grace, not of works. But uh, the, the number of stars upon our crowns will be determined by our diligent efforts and works that we do for the Lord. Okay? So we're saved by grace, but we're rewarded by our works in Christ. Amen? Now look what the spirit of prophecy says we should teach our children. Look what it says in Testimonies to the, to the Church, volume 6, page 451. It says, teach your children that God has a claim upon all they possess, a claim that nothing can ever cancel. Whatever they have is theirs only in trust as a test of their obedience. Inspire them with ambition to gain stars for their crown by winning many souls from sin to righteousness. Did y'all catch that? It says we are supposed to inspire our children to win souls for Christ and to gain stars on their crown. That's what we're supposed to be inspiring them with ambition to do that. So instead of inspiring our children with ambition to get rich and to establish a successful career like most Adventist parents do, because that's what we're supposed to do as good parents, right? We are called to inspire our children to earn stars upon their crown, a treasure that uh, they will be able to keep for eternity. But unfortunately, the effort to work to save souls is considered trivial and unimportant to many church folk due to the fact that we get absolutely no reward in this life. And this is why many Adventists are not so concerned about souls in the kingdom of God nor earning uh, stars upon their crown. Now listen to uh, Testimonies to the Church, Volume 4, page 358. It says, If your aptness and skill had been as much exercise in saving souls and in disseminating the truth to those who are in darkness as it has been to gain and to increase your earthly possessions, 
you would have many stars in the crown of your rejoicing uh, uh, of rejoicing in the kingdom of glory. There are but few who are as faithful in the service of God as they are in the service of their own temporal interests. That's a powerful statement right there. So if we were as diligent and as faithful and loyal uh, in the work of God as we are to making money and to establishing our career, we will have what? A whole lot of stars on our crown. So if there was any message that Adventists need to hear in October 24, uh, October 2024, it's this. Why do we put so much effort to earn earthly possessions which will pass away and yet so little effort to disseminate the truth to those who are in darkness and not only earn eternal stars on our crown, but have the privilege, well, this is the best part, is have the privilege of you being in heaven and seeing these souls that you have reached. Why do we put so much effort in, in attaining earthly wealth that will pass away? Like the rich young ruler, we have to make the decision what's most important. Earthly treasure or heavenly treasure? And what, he, what was his choice? Unfortunately, it was earthly treasure and he missed out on eternal life and salvation. So what we need to understand is that all this money and wealth that we've accumulated and that we are accumulating is soon going to be completely worthless. Not only when Christ comes, but even before that. Evangelism, page 63, says the very means that is now so sparsely sparingly invested in the cause of God and that is selfishly retained will in a little while be cast with all idols to the moles and to the bats. Money will soon depreciate in value very suddenly. How fast is this going to happen? Very suddenly. One moment the stock market will be prospering, the next minute it's going to be, it's going to crash. Okay? That's what, that's what we're warned of. Money will soon depreciate in value very suddenly when the eternal reality of eternal scenes uh, opens in the senses of man. So money is going to is going to depreciate the value of the dollar, the value of, of, of all the currencies is going to crash unexpectedly and it's going to be cast to the moles and to the bats and we are, uh, we are forewarned in the spirit of prophecy of an economic collapse. And yet we're still earnestly working to attain these material things. Now what's going to cause this economic collapse? We're told in Manuscript Release, Volume 4, page 88, it says that the trade unions will be one of the agencies that will bring upon this earth a time of trouble such as not been since the world began. So we're told that the trade unions are going to be one of the causes that bring in the time of trouble. And what happened this past week? We had the, uh, the, the union strike. The, uh, we had a historic union strike. We haven't had one like this since uh, what the, the, uh, the year I was born, 1977. And uh, it cost America $5 billion per day. And it could have lasted much longer. Actually, it has, it's not technically over, it's just been postponed till uh, I think it's January the 15th. But for now it's over, but it costs $15 billion a day and, and, it, and, and we could have seen shortages and businesses, business failures and all types of hell break loose in our country. It just shows you how fragile life is and how fragile our economy is. But, uh, you know, this shows us that we are living so close to the end. And even though this labor union strike has been postponed, we're going to see, this tells us that we're going to see a whole lot more strikes taking place in labor unions as we get closer to the end. And it's going to ruin the economy. And we're going to see the value of money devalue very quickly. But we're also experiencing hurricanes, devastating hurricanes, like Helene. They say this is the second biggest disaster that we've experienced in this country's history. And uh, you know, there's still a whole lot of people that, are, that, are, that need to be rescued over there. Um, and many people that have died. We don't even know how many have died. We also see a, dr a dramatic rise of homelessness and economic instability in our country. And in the midst of all this, we as Abbott, as many of us still feel that laying up earthly treasure is more important than, than heavenly treasure. You see, if this would change, we would have more joy, we would have more peace in our souls in the present, but we would also have stars in our crowns and we would have the joy of seeing souls that we have reached in the kingdom of God. Now, for those of us today who feel like that reaching out to those that are in darkness to disseminate the truth to them is not that important or not essential, then I have some bad news for you today. I have some really bad news for you today. 
The book Last Day Events, page 282, says there will be no one saved. There will be no one saved in heaven with what? A starless crown. There will be not one soul in heaven that has a crown with no stars. And, the, and basically what that's saying is that if you don't have at least one star in your crown, you're not going to make it. So the question that we have to ask ourselves is who have I influenced to give their life to Jesus Christ? Who have I influenced to give their life to Jesus Christ? Because if I haven't influenced anybody, then I'm not going to make it. Now, some people might say, well, that's not fair. That's not fair. Why is it I have to spend my time and inconvenience myself to reach out to someone, uh, to someone else that's out there, to some stranger? Why should I have to do that? And, and, and th these are some of the similar questions that I asked myself as I was on the San Francisco mission trip uh, last month. And we went out there to distribute uh, great controversies. And it was a blessing, but as I was going there, I'm like, man, there's a lot of inconveniences I'm going through just to reach these people that are not non-religious. You know, they have the most uh, non-religious, uh, they have um, the largest percentage of people that have no religious affiliation in the, in, in the whole country, I believe. And, you know, some of those inconveniences is one, we had to, we had to wake up early every morning after packing books and canvassing the previous day for about seven hours. And after we got up, we had to drive to, uh, to the church that we were going to, which was right in the middle of San Francisco. And, I, and we had to basically sit in an hour to an hour and a half of traffic. Um, now, if we decided we wanted to sleep in a little bit, uh, that just meant longer traffic. So, you know, you, 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 you're gonna uh, suffer either way. Um, so it, that would mean longer traffic, and the closer you got to rush hour, the worse you got could go up to two hours or even longer. Gas was $5 a gallon, over $5 a gallon. Uh, we had to pay for parking, $30 a day, which we did, by God's grace, find a way out of that, at least some of the days. We had to cross the San Francisco Bay, uh, which was $7 every time you crossed the bridge. And then there was smog and pollution, and I, even, I felt my lungs actually uh, in pain. And Mia actually got a little sick from, from after she got back, probably from that smog. So I started asking myself, I was like, why in the world did I come all the way out here and go through all this just for a bunch, just to reach a bunch of people that are non-religious, that are not very interested in the word of God? And you know what the Lord reminded me of? He reminded me that he left the comforts of heaven to come down to this dark, cold planet to save those who are in darkness. He sacrificed his time, he sacrificed his money, and, and he worked to save the lost. He was hated, he was beaten, and rejected of men, and hung on the cross. And that's what we are remembering as we celebrate the Lord's Supper today. We're remembering the cost of sin. We're remembering the great sacrifice that was made for us. Jesus coming down from, from paradise, from perfection, and going through all that he did for us so that we can have the chance to be saved. And after being reminded of this, I was encouraged to do whatever it took and to make whatever sacrifice needed to reach a lost soul. And the result was some wonderful divine appointments that we had. And I know Mia, she wants to actually do a presentation of some of these experiences that she had, because this is probably one of the best, best trips that we've had despite of those conditions. So what we need to understand today is this, when it comes to a crown of life. Let's go to Luke chapter 14, verse 27. Luke chapter 14, looking at verse 27. The Bible tells us in Luke 14, verse 27, and it says, And whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be what? My disciple. What we need to understand today is this, is that if you are not willing to bear the cross, if you are not willing to be one of Christ's disciples, then therefore we cannot receive what? The crown. We cannot receive the crown. The title of the message today is No Cross, No Crown. If we're not willing to bear the cross, we're not getting that crown. Now, what does it mean to bear the cross? Let's go to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16, looking at verse uh, 21. Matthew 16, looking at verse 21. And it says 
in verse 21, it says, From that time forth began Jesus to show to his disciples how that he must go through Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, and, and saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan, thou art an offense unto me. For thou savorest not the things be of God, but those that be of men. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, what does he have to do? He has to what? Deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So here, this verse sheds some life on, on light on what it means to bear the cross. It tells us that we have to what? Deny ourselves. It says that we also have to bear the cross. And Jesus talked about previous to that, how we got to go through some persecution. All that live godly in Christ Jesus are going to have to suffer some type of persecution. And in and, 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 uh, Philippians 1.29, it says, uh, Philippians 1.29 tells us that not only must we believe, we want to be saved. Philippians 1.29 says not only must we believe on him, but what? We have to what? Suffer for his sake. We have to go through some suffering. That's what it says in Philippians 129. So what are some examples of this suffering that we might have to go through? Well, I, I, I look at uh, Samantha. Samantha, when she joined the church, her own biological mother would not talk to her, would not want, did not want to see her, and, and, and basically uh, cut off all communication with her, and, and, and yet she still continued to come to Westside. Praise the Lord. So that, that, that's an example of cross-bearing right there. That's an example. But praise God that uh, that over the years, the Lord is turning that around in their in communication right. again. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Maybe one day we'll see her in this church. We've got to keep her in prayer. Amen. But look what it says in, in Matthew chapter 10. Look at verse 34. Matthew chapter 10, verse 34. Jesus t t tells us what cross-bearing involves. Are we willing to experience this? Are we willing to go through what Samantha went through? Matthew chapter 10, looking at verse 34, says, Think not, I am come to send peace on earth. I am not come to send peace on earth, but I, I came uh, not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against his mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's foe shall be what? They of, his own. they of his own household. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. So cross bearing has to do with what? Social rejection and persecution. That's one part of cross bearing, but there's more to it than that. Another example of cross bearing is when it's 90 degrees outside or when it's 20 degrees outside. You know, we get a lot of extreme temperatures in, in, in the Midwest. And, and you, you feel like being in the comfort of your own home. And, but instead you choose to go out there and to suffer the weather and to go out into the community and to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, 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 and it, though it's not pleasant to your flesh, you receive a blessing and you feel the spirit of God uh, giving you strength. That's an example of cross bearing right there. Cross bearing also has to do with rejection from your employer. When you get a job and, and you tell them you can't work work on, on the Sabbath, and even and, and, and over the course of time, they respect your Sabbath, but then over time, they, they, they decide to uh, try to ask you to do a favor for them just one time. And, 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 and then you, you tell them no. But, but, but I, I, at first they accept that, but then uh, they, they say, well, you know, we're in a situation where we really need you to work. If you can't work, you, we're gonna have to let you go. And that's, that's also another example of cross-bearing. When we lose our job, over a moral issue, maybe the Sabbath, or maybe some other moral issue, we are bearing the cross. Cross-bearing also involves self-denial. You see, in order for us to get the crown, we have to be willing to deny ourselves, Jesus says. And there's some things that we have to deny ourselves of, and one of those things is sin. We have to deny ourselves of the, the, the desire to, uh, or, or, or give it in to the temptation to sin. We might say, well, I like to drink this. Or I like to eat this, but I know it's bad for me. We have to deny ourselves of that, amen? amen. Or maybe I like to watch this, even though I know it's demoralized in my mind. If we love Jesus, we have to bear the cross and what? We have to deny those things. Right. You see, as we partake of the communion cup today, we are basically making a statement that even though I love my darling sins, I love them. Uh, uh, but, but with your strength, I am willing to suffer and deny myself what I want because I'm following you. Amen? That's what we're doing That's when, when we partake of the communion cup. 
But not only do we need to deny ourselves of sin, we even need to sometimes deny ourselves of things that are not really sin, but could possibly distract us from Jesus. That might be, in your case, games. It might be uh, uh, personal goals for financial achievement. Now, is it wrong to be wealthy? No, it's not. We know it's not wrong to be wealthy. Uh, you know, wealth is a blessing from God. But, but something that we have to ask ourselves is that, and, 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 and something that we need to consider, is that there's a whole lot of souls out there that we could have reached in the time that we spend gaining wealth. Now, I read that, that uh, quote of testimonies to the church volume four. I'm going to read it again. It says, if your aptness and skill had been as much exercise in saving souls and in disseminating the truth to those who are in darkness as it has been to, gain, to get gain and increase your earthly possessions, you would have many stars in the crown of, of your rejoicing in the kingdom of glory. But uh, there are but few who are as faithful in the service of God as they are in service of God. Uh, 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 serving their own temporal interests. So cross-bearing involves what? Sacrifice. And some of these things that we like to do that are not wrong to do, if they're distracting us from the mission that God has called us to do, then we need to what? Surrender to the Lord. Now if you go around the churches and listen to the messages being preached, we hear a lot about heaven. We hear a lot about uh, um, you know, the, how heaven's going to be and, 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 and getting this crown of glory. But how much do we hear about cross-bearing? How much do we hear about persecution? How much do we hear about the mark of the beast? How much do we hear about self-denial? How much do we hear about denying what we want to eat and, and, and being temperate in, in, in our diet? How much do we hear about prioritizing Jesus above our own uh, immediate family members? How much do we hear about that? We don't hear very much. You see, God's messengers, we're called not just to preach the crown, we are called to what? Preach the cross. In fact, look, look at 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, looking at verse 17. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17, tells us what we need to preach. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17. It says, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach what? The gospel, not with the wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For what? The preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is what? Power. The power of God. So here Paul tells us to preach the gospel, which is, of course, the good news of Jesus' salvation, you know, of, of salvation through Jesus Christ. But it also tells us what? We need to what? Preach the cross. He admonishes us to preach the cross. And we already saw that cross preaching involves self-denial, persecution, suffering, and engaging in the, the, the hard labors of saving souls. That's cross bearing. We don't hear that preached today. And we're told by Paul to preach the gospel and to preach the cross. Now notice that Paul also admonishes us to not preach the gospel with the wisdom of words. He says, don't preach it with the wisdom of words. Now, what is the wisdom of, of words? Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 19 and 20, the following verses. It says, uh, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? So the wisdom of words is basically talking about what? The wisdom of this present world. So it tells us we're not supposed to preach the gospel with the wisdom of this world. What is the wisdom of this world? It's foolishness, that's right. But let me give you an example of the wisdom of this world. Now, if I was a part of a church, if you were part of a church who is ambitious to grow in numbers, how could you get people to join your church with the wisdom of this world? Using the tactics of the wisdom of this world. Well, people, what do people like? Yes, we have that. This is what marketers think about. What do people like? They like entertainment. You should read my sermon. <laughs> People like entertainment. So that means we got to turn our church into a theater where we'll watch movies, we'll have theatrical sermons, mimes, plays, and especially on the holidays, you got to have a Christmas play, you got to have an Easter play, and you got to have Halloween activities for the kids. That's using the wisdom of this world. Uh, since the hippie movement, Americans have fallen in love with rock and roll. After that, it was hip hop. So we got rock and roll and hip hop. Everyone loves rock and roll and hip hop. So we'll change the music from the old fashioned reverend hymns to
to more upbeat music that sounds like rap and a rock concert, basically. Okay, that's the wisdom of this world. Uh, people also don't like to be rebuked or corrected for their sins. Uh, uh, so we'll make sure that all the speakers will speak, speak smooth messages that don't ruffle any feathers. Most people love money, so we'll focus on Bible verses that speak of financial blessings. Uh, and, and we'll talk about you know, the self-denying uh, teachings of, of the Word of God. Cross-bearing, we won't talk about cross-bearing. Many people are involved in sexual immorality, premarital sex, adultery, and homosexuality. So we'll never bring up shacking up, we'll never bring up premarital sex, pornography, masturbation, adultery, and homosexuality. We'll just sidestep all those issues. Act like they're not going on in the world. So what I've mentioned to you basically is an example of teaching the gospel with the wisdom of this world. Now, um, unfortunately, this is what many churches have, are, are teaching now. This is what Babylon teaches. And we're not only seeing it in other denominational churches, but uh, uh, God's remnant church has said, hey, it's working for them. It's giving them numbers. So we're going to do the same thing. And we're seeing that. This is, this is why uh, a lot of people are house churching. This is why a lot of people have gotten frustrated with the church and have left the church because they don't see genuine spirituality. The church has resorted to the wisdom of this world to grow and, and uh, have, have polluted the gospel. Now, what are the terrible results of preaching the crown without the cross? What are the terrible results of preaching the crown without the cross? Let's go to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. We're going to look at three things and then, and then we'll be done. Matthew chapter 7, uh, looking at verse 21. Matthew 7, 21, it says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So the first major problem with preaching the uh, cr the crown without the cross is on judgment day all the people that are that are preaching that and all the people that are under that influence and receiving that wine that false doctrine Jesus is going to say depart from me ye that work iniquity because we wanted the crown but we're not willing to bear the cross right. and we held to iniquity we will not deny ourselves iniquity and will end up being lost. So that means a whole lot of people going to church that are going to be lost. All right. Um, problem or yeah, problem number two. Problem number two. Romans chapter uh, twelve, verse two. Romans chapter twelve, verse two. When we preach the the cr the crown without the cross, what are the bad results? What are the bad results? Result number two. Let's go to Romans chapter twelve, looking at verse two. Romans 12, looking at verse 2, it says, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So the Bible tells us do not what? Do not conform to the practice of this world. Do not adopt the wisdom of this world. So you see, when the cross-bearing, when cross-bearing is not preached and practiced, uh, compromise is the result. Compromise is the result. And uh, when the church compromises and conforms to worldly wisdom, many may join the church. But guess what? God leaves. God leaves. The most important thing uh, when I come to church on Saturday is that God's here. Now, I, I, I definitely want all of my brothers and sisters to be here, but the most important thing is that God's here because if God is not here, then guess what? There's no point in being here. And, and our attitude should be like Veronica. If God's not here, then I need to be gone. If God's not here, we're not upholding the, the, the truth of God's word and, and preaching under the influence of the Holy Spirit, then that means God is not here. See, God is the spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And we've lost sight of that verse. And we, we, it's more important for us to have a, a packed church and no God than, than to have a church with maybe a few members, uh, but, but God is there. Even if there's one person where two or three are gathered, the God's in the midst. Amen? Yeah. And then the last result is this. Revelation 3.18. Revelation 3.18. The 
straight testimony. Revelation 3.18. It says, uh, to the Laodicean church, it says, I counsel thee to what? Buy of me gold tried in fire that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. That gold tried in fire is referring to hardship, persecution, that will help to strengthen our faith and to develop our character to become like Christ. If we don't, if, if the gold is not purified by the fire, then what? It's not, it's not going to be very attractive, will it? No one's going to want it. No one's going to spend thousands of dollars if that gold is, is not attractive. So we have to be purified from the dross. So when we omit cross-bearing in our spiritual experience and we, in, our, in our preaching, we basically dwarf ourselves spiritually and dwarf, under our, dwarf those under our influence. So that they will be weak and they will be unprepared. They will be, uh, have a character that is not like Christ. So that's the third result. Now I believe that everyone here today, we want a crown. We all want a crown, right? If we show our hands, you want a crown of life, amen. And remember, we gotta have at least one star on that crown if we're gonna get it. But the appeal to us today is, are we willing to what? Bear the cross. Are we willing to bear the cross? Are you willing to bear the cross? Are you willing to endure through internal and external suffering. Internal and external suffering. It's not just external suffering. I mean, in America, maybe there won't be that much external suffering right now. But we know that time is coming. So there's a whole lot of internal suffering that we gotta go through right now. But there could be some external as well. But are you willing to endure the internal and external suffering that, that comes from choosing to do what God said versus what you wanna do? Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to live a life of self-denial instead of vanity and pride? Are you willing to sacrifice your comfort? We like to be comfortable. We like to be comfortable. You know, when, especially when we're, we're tired from, from work, we're tired from uh, life's challenges, but are, are we willing to step out of our comfort zones to meet strangers who need to hear this message of the gospel? Are we willing to do that? That's what cross-bearing involves. If that's what you're, if that's what you're willing to commit today, if you would um, raise your hand. Amen. Amen. That concludes our message for today.